program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. Let your service to God, let your service to the kingdom, let your service to one another, let your love that you're showing to one another through servanthood, let it be real. Let it be without hypocrisy. Because what happens, if you're only serving for the power, the rank, the position, only serving to be valued by others who see you, then your service is with hypocrisy. He said, let it be without hypocrisy. Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app brings you live church services direct to your smart TV and much more. You'll also get access to Changing Your World Network, streaming grace messages and exclusive content 24 hours a day right in the app. Get unlimited streaming through Roku, Amazon, and Apple TV absolutely free. Visit your app store. Download the Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app now to start streaming. For more information, visit CreflodollarMinistries.org. This is your world, so let's vow to make it a better place. Let every heart that needs to know, you love is here to stay. Oh, it's time we live a new life. Let us love shine bright in you. We sing by His grace, so we embrace your love today. The world is searching for significance in, in, significance in all of the wrong places and in all of the wrong ways. And a search for significance, what it does, it naturally produces the opposite of servanthood. When, you, when all you're in it for is, to, is, is meaning in your life and value and, and a search for your significance, and what happens is it's the opposite of servanthood, which is extreme selfishness and abnormal behavior. That, that's what's going to come out of it. When, when, you're, when you begin to serve out of that motive, out of the, the motive of searching for your significance, it has the opposite effect of servanthood, and it produces extreme selfishness. It produces abnormal behavior. And so many people serve in various capacities in the church from a host of false agendas. Listen to me now. A lot of people serve in various capacities in church when they're in the building, but they do it from a host of false agendas, false agendas. I'm reminded of this scripture. I, I think I want to share it with you in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, because what, what we're doing is sharing this so it can be a part of renewing your mind. And you got to renew your mind out of this pursuit of self-love in a sense. And, and listen, I understand it's important to love yourself. I know, I know, you know, uh, love others as you love yourself. I get all of that, but you know what I'm saying? It's this type of self-love that says, I need power, I need praise, I need to be recognized, I need rank, I need position, I need for somebody to see me serving and now congratulate me. I need for some, somebody to look at who I'm serving and now think of me higher than what they used to think of me of. All of these false agendas. And all of it has to be something that's got to look at. So now verse 1 talks about our full dedication to God. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So he says in view of the mercies of God that the previous chapter talked about, he said, at least you can do is dedicate your whole life to me, you know, not just being there in spirit, but I want your body there also. At least you can do is dedicate yourself. And then he says, and, and before this dedication can, can come to pass, verse 2 has come to pass. You can't be conformed to this world. And, and you can't allow your thinking to be conformed to this world. And, and you can't allow, you know, uh, your hunger to be validated, being conforming, you know, you're conforming with the world and you're, you're doing things so you can, you know, get applause by men. Like I said, the last series, that's the pride of life. You're still working on things to make it seem like you're important. You want to be important to people. 
And see, that's conforming to the world. And he says, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed or changed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Be transformed and changed. Uh, be a person that, you know, you can serve God out of a pure heart because you're in love with God and you're in love with the kingdom and you're in love with what matters to Jesus. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a transformation. It's going to require a change of heart, change of mind, change of direction. And he says you do that by renewing your mind. Hopefully by seeing all of these scriptures and, and, and hearing a series on servanthood, it's going to help you to begin to initiate renewing your mind the right way so you can serve the right way. He says, transform by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Come on. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, do not think of himself, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. But to think soberly, that means you're not intoxicated in your thinking. He says when you think higher of yourself than you ought to think, you're intoxicated. You're like a drunken man thinking out of balance. He says, but be sober according as God has dealt to every man, what? A measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, check this out, and all members have not the same office. Go on. They're not the same office. So, so we being many are one body in Christ, and everyone members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith, seven, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhorting, exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Verse 9 is what I'm after. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Now, verse 9, look at this in the Amplified, because what he is saying is, let love be without hypocrisy. Be real about your love. Be real about your love. He says, let your love be sincere. Let it be a real thing. Man, let, let your love be sincere. Let it be a real thing. Let your servanthood be sincere. Let it be a real thing. Hate what is evil. Loathe all ungodliness. Turn in horror from wickedness, but hold fast to that which is good. Let it be real. Let it be real. Let your service to God, let your service to the kingdom, let your service to one another, let your love that you're showing to one another through servanthood, let it be real. Let it be without hypocrisy. Because what happens, if you're only serving for the power, the rank, the position, only serving to be valued by others who see you, then your service is with hypocrisy. He said, let it be without hypocrisy. So, if we are not extremely careful, this is so serious, and if we're not constantly checking our motives, we could be fooling ourselves. And I don't want you fooling yourselves. I don't want you fooling yourself. I mean, listen, I'm not trying to make anybody mad or make anybody feel guilty or anything like that. I'm just trying to say, check yourself out. Check your motive out. Check out why you do what you do. Look in an honest mirror and ask yourself, why am I doing what I do? That's a big deal, man, a big deal. So let's, let's be careful. Let's check out our motives. I, I can't, listen, the most powerful thing you can do on a day-to-day -day basis is to check out your motives. Check out your motives because I, I guarantee you, when those motives go unfulfilled, there's going to be a lot of division and bitterness and all kinds of things because you didn't get the wrong motives. And then you'll end up quitting, and you'll be mad at ministry and mad at church and mad at me and mad at everybody because you did what you did out of the wrong motive. Because what happens is, if the truth be told, if you do something expecting something and then you don't get what you expect, then disappointment is the result. And sometimes that's what happens when you go into things with wrong motives. Here's another concern. We need to identify 
and we need to work towards serving the real needs of others, watch this, and not unhealthy neurotic wants, unhealthy abnormal neurotic wants. We've got to be careful, even as servants, not to serve people because they want comfort and they want happiness and not to serve people who want to be served. There's a big issue there with serving people who want to be served. I, I, I've met pastors who have people serving them because they want to be served or serving them because it brings them comfort and it brings them happiness. And that's not what I'm talking about here. Many who follow Christ, they follow him for the wrong motives. Many who follow Christ, they follow Christ for food. They follow Christ for, for, for political reasons. In John 6, 15, some followed because they thought that uh, they could make him king. And Jesus knew what was in their hearts, and he was like, I'm not doing that. So, you know, you, you can follow, but are your motives right? I mean, when you join our church and you become a part of our ministry and you join a department, are you joining to be a servant so you can serve other people and the kingdom and God at the same time with the gifts and talents that he gave you, the anointing that he gave you for somebody else? Or is there a motive? Is there a carefully planned motive that says, well, if I can start serving in the vision keeper, then I can get closer to this, then I might get closer to the pastor, then, uh, you know, I, I might be able to become his best friend, and then, and you got all these things that are going on, and, and, and then when none of that happens, now you're mad at church, you're mad at God, you're mad at everything because you initiated a type of servanthood that had a selfish ending to it. A selfish ending to it. And so we've got to make sure, and that, that's a, one of my a big concern to me, is, is that people are not serving uh, other people based on their real needs. We've somehow gotten off and we're serving someone's unhealthy needs, some, someone's abnormal need, and just kind of saying, well, I'm just going to serve just whatever. No, that's just not how that's supposed to go. I told you, I think, last week that God and the kingdom has got to be the foundation of your, your service, first of all. If that's not the foundation of why you do what you do, then you are probably going to get caught up into something that's going to be very hurtful, very painful, very neurotic, very abnormal, and very unhealthy. Because we should not be trying to serve someone's unhealthy wants and desires just to make them happy and to serve somebody that, that wants to be served, to serve somebody's narcissism. That's just not how that works. Amen? So that, that's one of the concerns. Now, uh, let me talk to you about this one here, and I, I, I'll, I'll go on with some stuff, but here's another concern. Uh, my concern, and I just mentioned it, is the negative consequences that come out of selfish service. The negative consequences that come out of selfish service service. Um, service that is self-serving simply cannot hold up under the pressure. It can't hold up under the pressure of the ministry and the large dose of criticism that oftentimes comes with it and goes with this territory of service. A lot of people don't understand that, but when you serve others, uh, others in the kingdom, there's an enormous amount of pressure and there's a lot of criticism that comes. And if you're doing it out of a selfish heart of serving, then you, you, won't, you won't be able to stand under the pressure of all of that criticism and stuff that comes as a result of you serving. So it's got to be out of the right motives. So eventually this kind of self-seeking service will crumble under criticism because it, it's more concerned about self and is more concerned about one's personal significance than with the needs of other people. And, man, as soon as you go online and somebody's dogging you out and calling you, you know, that's, 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 uh, that's just Pastor Dow's little puppy, you know, you know to kick around. So you, you'll, you'll crash on it because you're there with the wrong motives. In fact, if we fail to find our significance in Jesus, we will become obsessed with gaining recognition 
because we won't find our significance in Jesus Christ. So we're just working real hard to get somebody to, to recognize us. I remember a long time ago, I had, I had people in our, 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 our vision keepers department, they just, they just wanted to stand up and be recognized. They weren't doing nothing. They, 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 they would never serve the kingdom. They was only themselves. They just wanted people to know that they were vision keepers and, and they were standing up in front of the pulpit and they were just, you know, wanted to be recognized. And, and I'm telling you, the danger in that, you know, you become obsessed with gaining recognition, and this will often lead to burnout. But not only will it lead to burnout, it'll lead to anger, it'll lead to bitterness, and a heart that is poisoned against the ministry. A heart that's poisoned against the ministry. Why? Because your service, your service had selfish endings. And it, it was not out of a heart to serve the consequences, the negative consequences that come out of selfish service. I've met so many people that have been poisoned against the ministry and poisoned against the church simply because they didn't have pure motives in what they did. Because when you do something, first of all, to serve God in the kingdom, that's where it's got to be, first of all. It's like I got to work as unto the Lord and then whatever happens on my job can't bother me because I'm doing this as unto the Lord. And so likewise, when I, when I come into a ministry and I begin to function and operate in an area of the ministry, whether it's singing or ushering or, or whatever it might be, I've got to make sure that I'm not bringing with me wrong motives with selfish ends because there are negative consequences that come. And now you're upset with the church and you're poisoned and then you move to the next level of becoming an enemy of the cross and you're bad-mouthing preachers and you're talking about how bad the church is and you're, you're getting in, in a, worse, a, a worse situation than even before because maybe you didn't know the negative consequences that arise when you decide to have self-service or selfish service, there are negative consequences. So I, I thought that was really cool to be able to share with you and to look at that because that's what's going on. That's when you look at some guy who's serving for a week and he's gone the next week because it's not going according to his plan. It's not working like he wanted to work. I mean, by now, you know, I thought I should have been in the pulpit presiding or something. By now, I thought I should have been singing the solo in the choir. By now, I thought I should be the guy that's driving the special speakers around. By now, see, you, you came in with wrong motives. It's just got to be simply, I'm in it for the kingdom. I'm in it for God. And when I serve other people, I do it without hypocrisy. Wow. Listen, I'm qualified to teach this. I've been serving for 40 years in different capacities. And in those capacities, one of the things that I've learned is when you set yourself up for disappointment because you have wrong motives, Man, it leads to some very negative things. And you have to go at it the right way. And until you can go at it the right way, don't go at it. Until you are prepared to serve with a heart that's pure and have no motives, wrong motives behind it, then you probably just need to hold up. But then again, you know, Jesus is saying that let the greatest amongst you be a servant. And if servanthood is going to be the pathway to success, dude, I need to get this fixed. I need to get it fixed because success is waiting. The, the purpose and the plan of God is waiting on me. There's a path that's there. I have access to that path. But for me to go down that pathway with the wrong motives, <laughs> man, that's, that's, that's something we don't want. All right? Now, are there hindrances to developing a servanthood mentality? Are there going to be things that will come against you developing a servanthood mentality? Then we probably need to look at some of them to get some kind of idea of what that's going to be about. So, number one, the desire for status, we've mentioned that, or the desire to feel important is a hindrance to developing a servant heart or servanthood mentality. A desire for status 
or to feel important, a desire for status or to feel important. Now, you already, we've already seen in John chapter 13, uh, the disciples at first refusing to take the towel. And so, because we want to know who's the greatest amongst you. But when Christians fail to rest in who they are in Christ first, when they fail to rest and be confident in who they are in Christ, they will constantly, constantly be battling the need for importance and, and, and value from within their own desire and felt need because they have not settled the issue of their identity and who, they're in, who they are in Christ. And whatever you fail to settle in Christ Jesus becomes a hindrance. I mean, the desire for status is going to be there. The desire to want to be important or feel important is going to be there. Why? Because we fail to understand who we already are. We fail to rest in who we are in Christ, who we are in Christ. We're still trying to be something uh, before other people instead of who we are in Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You're familiar with this scripture, battling for the need of importance, battling to be important. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man... If any man be in Christ, he is what? He's a new creature. Old things are what? Passed away. And behold, all things are become new. I'm a new creature. I'm in Christ. I am a new creature. I'm a new creation. I'm not the same as I used to be. I, I don't have to, uh, you know, work hard to, you know, feel important. I'm important to God. I'm the apple of his eye. I've been accepted into his beloved. That's a powerful thing. It's a powerful truth. But if you don't receive who you are in Christ, if you don't, see, if you don't receive your value in Christ, then you will constantly try to get it from other people. We think that happiness will come when we are treated in a certain way. But that's just not, that's just not the case. Because I don't know if you know it yet, but there will always be those who do not treat us like we want to be treated. There's always going to be somebody who won't treat you the way you want to be treated. And so, happiness shouldn't come based on, you know, how we're treated. If we're treated a certain way, then I'm happy. When I'm not treated a certain way, I'm not happy. No, I've got to, I've got to settle all that in Christ Jesus. Amen. Here's the second hindrance to operating in the servanthood mentality, the second hindrance. Number two, human strategies to meet one's own felt needs. A bunch of human strategies to meet one's own felt need. This can be a hindrance to a servanthood mentality. Your own strategies, your own strategies to try to meet your own felt needs. So our need, listen to this, our need and responsibility, that's, here's what we need. Our need, listen to this, our need and responsibility is to trust God. That's what I need. I need to trust God for my acceptance. I need to trust God for my ability. I need to trust God for my production in life. I need to trust God for my strength in life. I don't need to come up with a strategy to try to meet my own felt needs. I need to trust God. God's already made all that available. I need to trust Him. L let me share some of those scriptures I just quoted. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and 6. I mean, when it comes to who I am, I don't need to come up with a, with a strategy so I can believe that I'm loved by God. No, especially when he says this in Ephesians chapter 1 and 6. He says, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. I'm accepted. God has accepted me in the beloved. And so that's what I'm going to believe. I don't need to come up with a human strategy. I need to just use the faith of what Jesus has already, you know, planned for my life.